Welcome to today's web conference. Learn more about Office 365 E5 Enterprise Value and Opportunities for Partners with Power BI and Advanced eDiscovery. I'd like to turn it over to your first presenter, Michael Penseroli, National PTS for Microsoft. Michael, you now have the floor. Well, thanks, Kim, and good morning and Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to our January call. And uh, in this call, uh, I'm joined here with Amanda uh, Hill uh, from our National PTS team, and we have a couple of great Microsoft experts today. And over the past few months, we've been focusing on uh, the E5 uh, uh, SKU for Office 365, which really has just packed a lot of great enterprise value. And so uh, today, we're going to be continuing our, our focus on that, and we're going to be talking about uh, Office 365 uh, Advanced eDiscovery, and we have Michelle uh, Ostrom here with us, and she's the Vice President of Quivio Integration. And then uh, we're going to talk about Power BI, and I'm uh, happy to have the Senior Product Manager for BI Advanced Analytics, Alan Herrera. So we've got a great agenda today. I'm personally very excited. I've, I've, I've looked at the content. I know I'm going to learn a lot uh, myself. And so just a quick note on the next slide, just uh, if you are new to our community or maybe you're not taking advantage of all of our assets, you can download these slides as usual. And I did mention that this was uh, going to be our, our fourth uh, presentation on, on E5. And so if you're interested in uh, what all uh, we've talked about over the last few months, uh, you can that same AKA MS U.S. Office 365 call, you can get the previous recordings and just kind of catch up because there's so much new. We've just had a lot of uh, interest from partners, whether it be Skype for Business or Power BI or Advanced e Discovery and the new security capabilities. Uh, there's really a lot there. So we have um, a packed agenda for, uh, for you today. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and move on to our first presenter, Michelle Ostrom. Michelle, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and I'll give you the floor. Great. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, what we'll do today is we'll just give you hopefully an overview of Office 365 Advanced eDiscovery. Um, I think there's some things that I want to cover first, just to level set. I know there's varying degrees of understanding of really what is eDiscovery and why is it so important to these corporations. So we'll do a little level set first, and then we will uh, talk a little bit about the offering in E5. And then lastly, we'll talk about really opportunities. What do opportunities for you look like? And how can you bring more business in with you? How can you partner with uh, others in the community to actually drive this value home? So that's really uh, going to be our primary focus. Um, there's going to be a few slides that I'm going to actually move through kind of quickly. If there's areas that you want to dive deeper on, please let Michael and, and Amanda know, and we can always circle back on those as well. So uh, eDiscovery is actually part of a bigger offering um, for Microsoft, and these are kind of some buzzwords that if you aren't already familiar with these, you'll absolutely want to note them. Um, compliance is really a much bigger issue um, in the world of uh, the corporations right now. So compliance uh, spans a lot of different areas, and eDiscovery is just one of those. You'll see in E5 that we actually have something that's called the Compliance Center. And we have brought in several of our workloads into the Compliance Center, including archiving, auditing, and eDiscovery. Today we're going to really focus on one of those because uh, each one of these really deserves its, its own time and place. So within eDiscovery, there are some areas that we've actually expanded on. Um, and I think the, the primary focus that we want to level set on is really understanding what is eDiscovery. And that has to do with identifying electronic information within a corporation. It can often be event-driven, which we'll talk a little bit more about that. It could be having to do with an investigation or a litigation. Or it could be reoccurring and ongoing, more in a compliance uh, type of mechanism. That electronic information, once it's identified, as we all know, there's so much data out there, tons and, and petabytes and zettabytes of data. How do we identify really the data that is necessary to this particular uh, matter, to this particular issue, to this ongoing investigation? And so the process of e-discovery is actually uh, going in and finding what we're looking for. So there's ways that we can use processes, we can use technology, we can use professional services to actually identify that data and then reduce that data set to only uh, turn over to either opposing counsel or to uh, the powers that be what we actually absolutely need. So why is eDiscovery so important? Why is it such a big deal? Well, there's a few reasons why. Um, 
it often has to do with litigation and lawsuits. Um, the U.S. in particular is extremely litigious. So we have some statistics here where over 40% of large organizations have one or more lawsuits that are 20 million or above at a particular issue. That is extremely uh, large amounts of money when you're speaking to these corporations. The median litigation budget, excluding settlement costs, is roughly around 1.2 million. So legal costs for the biggest U.S. banks alone uh, in, in uh, 2014 totaled over $30 billion. So there's a lot of money at stake here, but oftentimes it's not just uh, a cost that are at stake. It can often be reputations or sometimes it's even bet the uh, company type situations. So the risk is very high. Uh, it's not just, again, uh, uh, dollars that are at stake, but it can be reputations and it can actually be entitled, uh, entire companies. This is, gives you a statistics for a financial institution that was fined $9 million for just failing to produce customer emails. This was happened to be in a, an arbitration proceeding. So again, these things are going on all the time. Typically, the data that uh, we're dealing with in eDiscovery is very high-risk data. If you look on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, you will see things going on that have to do with eDiscovery daily. It's very uh, uh, in the front of the newspaper. These are things that aren't necessarily happening behind the scenes. Um, so it can be uh, at the top of mind for a lot of CEOs, COOs, compliance officers, um, Office of the General Counsel. So we'll talk about some of the different players um, as we move through this. So eDiscovery, as I said, is really about identifying um, the relevant information. If you look at the workflow for data in an eDiscovery process, these are kind of some of the big buckets in terms of that workflow. Um, the process typically has to do with identifying or preserving that data. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in Office 365, about doing more of this in place. And then as we move through, we're going to use uh, different technologies and uh, workflows and skill sets to search that data, analyze that data, leverage analytic capabilities, and then review a very small subset to produce that to the other side. If you look at the review on the far right-hand corner, that really has to do with attorneys that are looking at that data. That's where the primary cost is involved. So if we can do things that are further up in the workflow, to minimize the amount of data that the attorneys are having to look at for their billable hours and deciding on each document, is this responsive or is it not responsive to my particular case? We can save time, we can save cost, but again, most importantly is we can also reduce the risk of, of moving these large volumes of data out into the world. We can keep it in place and really just have the attorneys focus on what they really need to look at. This is a very, very big deal. Um, if we go back 10 years ago, that big stack of data on the left is really what the attorneys were looking at. So huge billable hours to the corporations. Through technology and processes and workflow, we're able to reduce that down to a much uh, more reasonable subset of data. I'm going to just kind of um, move through these pretty quickly because we talk a lot about um, Office 365, but what about data that's outside um, Office 365? So there's definitely um, workloads and work streams where we can get that data all into one place for the corporation, and then we can also use uh, other workloads within Office 365 in that e-discovery process. So whether we have disparate data that's in Exchange, um, in emails, we've got documents in SharePoint, we have Skype meeting, we can actually, all of that data is discoverable. Um, when you talk to the courts, it really doesn't matter where it is or the type of technology or mechanisms that were used. They want to know if it's pertinent to this case, if it's relevant to the case, it needs to be identified and brought forward. We use actually uh, other partners to do some of this work for us as well. So conversions can happen up front if there's Lotus Notes data, um, other mechanisms. Those can go over to um, third parties and have that data actually converted and loaded into Office 365. So there's a whole mechanism and system in place for that as well. So let's talk a little bit about Office 365 and some of the changes that are in place. Um, it's really all about simplifying e-discovery. We are bringing now capability that has typically um, been uh, outsourced to legal service providers um, or to the law firms, and we're bringing some of that technology and some of that capability in-house so corporations can actually put their hands on it, or they can uh, bring in their professionals to actually run the process uh, their way. 
the key to all of this is, again, in place. And you're going to hear me say that over and over again. So if you take away one thing, that's the value of this e-discovery capabilities within E5. It's being able to do more in place. So you're, we will be able to do things like searching, which is very standard and very common, but we're adding and making our search capabilities much more robust. We've added analytics, which has to do with the Quivio uh, component that was integrated over this past year. And then, of course, being able to export what really matters. You need to be able to get the data out of the system. So if you need to turn it over to the courts, to opposing counsel, um, you can do that. So we want to be able to make sure we get it out of the system. In place, here it goes again. So we want to be able to do much more of this within their uh, tenant, within the Office 365 tenant. Again, if you look at the workloads in past, the typical work stream was we would identify all this data. It could be gigabytes, or it could be terabytes, or even petabytes of data. And then it was shipped off to somebody else's data center. We don't have to do that anymore. Those corporations now can do much more in, in place. They can identify the documents that they want, and they can run some of these simple processes on those by searching and running analytics to reduce that data set with no impact to the, to the user, which is absolutely uh, critical to all of this. They can continue on their workflow, and a lot of this can happen behind the scenes as opposed to stopping, stopping business for the, the uh, litigation pieces to happen. Searching in place, we can do this real time now, so no waiting for indexing. Before, we would have to identify the data, and then you'd run indexing to, so we could search on this. This is all happening real place and in time with E5. This allows us to find relevant data much faster and make decisions very quickly. When it comes to courts, legal processes, you have to be moving very quickly and have this data readily accessible. In E5, um, some of you may be familiar with some of the e-discovery uh, capabilities that were actually launched sort of more in E1 and E3. We really enhanced a lot of the searching components, because searching is just really just kind of the bread and butter of e-discovery. It's just the absolute bare minimum basics. But we've made it much faster. We've uh, had it so it works across the workloads. We've reduced a lot of the restrictions in terms of scalability. So things are faster, more scalable, and we've allowed more capabilities to identify some sensitive information like numbers, social security numbers, government IDs, credit card numbers. Again, all very um, important information during this process. So advanced um, e-discovery. This piece, you should note, is only available in E5. So this is really um, the components of Equivio that they acquired uh, one year ago in, in January uh, 2015. These are the different um, buckets, if you will, for the advanced e-discovery pieces. So clustering allows you to identify documents and bring them together. So we could look across millions and millions of documents and very quickly see what is this, what is this data set about. Is it about fraud? Is there about issues? Does it have to do with the, the IP infringement? Um, does it have to do with money laundering? We can quickly see what those conversations are about. Near duplication and email threading allows us to organize documents and reduce that data set very quickly. So we don't have to look at the same documents over and over and over again. And it allows us to organize email threads. So if Michael and I went back and forth on this particular phone call 20 times, we could actually just turn over that last thread to the attorneys and then look at one document. Huge savings. We just reduced 19 documents. They didn't have to click, open, make a decision, close. Click, open, make a decision, and close. It's all about productivity gains. Lastly, predictive coding. People get very excited about technology-assisted review, and there's a lot of great things about it. We can take experts that are either in the corporations or their, uh, their identified counsel, and that expert can train the system on a small subset of data. So we could have 1,500 documents reviewed and looked at, and then all of that knowledge applied to that small subset of data, let's say that 1,500 or 2,500 documents, those decisions can then go be applied to millions of documents. So we can then just export out of the system those documents that were deemed by the technology, by the predictive coding and the analytics responsive to the case. Again, we have huge productivity gains and not taking tons and tons of billable hours from the attorneys. Hopefully I'm not offending uh, any attorneys that are on the call. <laughs> 
we're really trying to reduce that cost for in the time and risk for the corporations. That's our clear focus. Again, getting data out of the system is key. Um, so if you have clients that are asking you, hey, but my, my data is up there and I need to do all these things to it, but it's, it's in my tenant, you absolutely need to be able to export the data when the time is right. So there's different um, export capabilities that you'll have available. So no problem there. Let's talk a little bit about the ecosystem because this is, um, gives you an idea of the different players and then we're going to talk about sort of the partners and how the partners fit into all this. So to make sure we're all on the same page here, um, the regulatory agencies are the ones that often kick off uh, e-discovery things. So uh, they are often at play, not always, and then there's some type of an event litigation and investigation. So things could be very event driven and reactionary at your at your client, at your your customer. But you could also have things that are reoccurring and ongoing. They could have continued HR investigations. Um, you could be working with healthcare and things could just be continual. So things could be actual perpetual or again event driven. You can see over on the uh, right-hand side, sort of in that circle, these are the different players that we have in the ecosystem. And this is how it's been. I've been working in e-discovery for over 16 years. And so these are really still the players, even though Office 365 is really changing the landscape by allowing more of this to happen at the corporation. The corporations will outsource um, a lot of their legal needs to their law firms. They're their trusted advisor. That's not going away by any means. They want them to practice law. That's what they, they are on the hook in terms of the responsibility of what needs to happen in that legal process. The other direction is you'll see legal partners. We call them service providers out in the, the um, legal industry. They are subject matter experts on e-discovery and compliance. That's all they do. You guys do all sorts of stuff in terms of implementations and, and migrations of data and you guys do a whole host of, of things. These guys are really niche players that focus very, very deeply on e-discovery. They go very deep in that matter. They are also trusted advisors both to the corporation and to the law firms. And in the center there, you have the e-discovery case at hand and the software. And so the software could either reside at the partners who in the past have had the big data centers or with Office 365, more of those capabilities are moving upstream and will actually be housed uh, within the corporation's environment. And that would be in the Office 365 cloud environment, especially with E5. So it's important to understand just the basics of, of these players and who's involved. Um, when we talk about who we want to sell to, I just wanted to walk you guys through this very quickly so you kind of have an idea of the low-hanging fruit. Um, while any company could be uh, in some type of uh, litigation situation or a compliance situation or needing some type of e-discovery, again, e-discovery is identifying the data that's actually relevant to what they're looking for. It could be um, one person's PST file. Absolutely. Do they want to look through those 2,000 documents one at a time? of their employees, I know that I don't, or could they leverage capabilities that they have in, in E5? I'd rather leverage the capabilities and find what I'm looking for in a matter of minutes within, instead of a matter of hours and days. But the, the, the ones that are highly litigious and have continual e-discovery needs, the low-hanging fruit are these types of industries, the highly regulated industries, financial services, um, life sciences, often pharmaceutical companies, high tech, um, lots of uh, IP infringement issues, energy and manufacturing, um, and I put in automotive. Automotive seems to have a lot of a lot of litigation situations as well. Um, who within those customers would you be speaking to? So often, um, Microsoft and our partners are dealing with with IT. IT would absolutely be working with this type of technology and be implementing it, but the business users within the corporation are different. So those are Office of the General Counsel, or you might hear it called the OGC. They are the ones, the OGC has the ear of the CEO, of the CIO, of the COO, the CFO. If, if the Office of the General Counsel says something is wrong, or there is an issue, or we need to save money, or we need money, all those, all those C-levels are listening. It's a very powerful position. So within the Office of the General Counsel, you have your legal teams, but also influencers that are outside of the corporation are law firms and lawyers, 
And then, of course, those service providers, the trusted advisors, um, on a technology and a workflow standpoint. So this kind of gives you an idea, again, of some of the names and some of the buzzwords. Um, you might hear chief security officer. Um, those are also um, people that are really uh, responsible for the compliance aspect. So what to look for when you're talking to your corporations. Um, they may have a specific event, or this could be something that's an ongoing need. They may have investigations, litigations. There could be a merger and acquisition, or some type of due diligence that needs to happen, or government inquiries. Those are things that when you're in there talking to your IT professionals, you may ask them and say, hey, have you guys spoken to you know, your legal teams? We have some great things in E5. This, that might really help them. Again, you will need to be able to bring those people to the table for them to really understand what the value is and be able to drive that home. And I think at the end of the day, that's really going to help you drive that, that E5 sale. So one of the, the questions that we get is, um, gosh, that sounds scary. We don't know very much about e-discovery. We get the basics that you've walked us through and we've heard a little bit about it. And not only that, our e IT folks that we're working with, they don't understand e-discovery. So now you want us to bring lawyers to the table and have a conversation. We don't feel like we can do that very well. So we understand that. One, we're here to help you. But two, we also have those partners that I mentioned as part of that ecosystem that can absolutely partner with you. So it's more of a partner to partner going in with your customer. So you own that relationship, you're driving the sales cycle, but when you feel like it's time or it'd be beneficial to have an E5 conversation that has to do with e-discovery, we have experts who have used the Equivio technology that are very familiar with the analytics, that understand the value proposition, and are working on the E5 workflows that can dive very deep for you. And so when I've had these conversations with other partners and even Microsoft um, field sales team, there's typically a huge sigh of relief. Great. We have expertise. Not only are we building the expertise, they've, already, they've been doing this for years. So they have expertise. They have um, relationships often established, potentially even with your current customer at the OGC level. So somebody that you, an, or a group that you potentially are not even talking to. And it's really about how can we create success at the corporation. So their goals are exactly the same as yours in terms of they want success in the corporation, but they really care about that e-discovery piece where you're looking at it more holistically in terms of Office 365. So I'll just run through this really quickly just to give you a quick idea of who these e-discovery partners. These are things that they um, have their expertise on. So when you're getting a feeling of like, well, hey, wait a minute, we're a partner, they're a partner, you can see potentially more, more often than not, there's not a ton of overlap. This is their core area of practice. They focus on litigation, they've got workflow and data optimization, managed service offerings, again, all having to do with compliance and e-discovery. They do case management, they do um, forensics and expert testimony in front of the cases, and they can figure out best practices in terms of e-discovery and compliance for information governance. All really, really helpful. Um, and it's going to make everybody look a lot smarter when you bring that subject matter expertise to the table, again, based upon how you're driving your sales cycle. These are different technologies and tools that they are very familiar with, having to do with complex searching and database analytics, data migration, review tools, um, clustering technologies, in-place hold, predictive coding, Equivio analytics. Again, these are all um, a part of sort of the, the e-discovery um, marketplace out there. So who are they? I just wanted, these are not a comprehensive list, but this just gives you an idea of some of these um, partners. Um, Ernst & Young isn't on here. Um, KPMG is a familiar name. But some of these other ones are very much niche players. DTI, um, Lighthouse eDiscovery is actually here in Seattle. Um, they are all very focused either on having a segment that is 100% um, compliance, e-discovery, information protection focused, or their entire company deals with litigation support. So this just gives you a quick idea of some of the players in the space. So working together, um, there's really a couple ways, um, and I'm almost finished. I'm just going to show you this slide, and then I'm going to pop over and show you how you can actually find some of these partners. Um, there's really two ways uh, that I see you guys being able to work with these partners. One is upfront in that sales process, which is what I just mentioned to you. So they can really come in and help you close E5 business and have a much deeper conversation if you deem that appropriate. 
So bring them in early, and they are more than uh, happy and excited to collaborate with you. They'll be one of you at the table and help you close that business. But two, just as importantly, is when we get that E5 business closed, they will be able to help drive usage and adoption of these e-discovery capabilities so they don't sit there and collect dust. We really want to make sure that the corporations are successful. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot at risk. We want them to be able to use these tools very well. So that may be in a managed service environment. They might hire somebody like, if you go back to the previous slide, if we look at um, somebody like um, Discover Ready, they might hire them to come in and actually be behind uh, their quote unquote firewall or their tenant and actually move that data for them and run the process in a managed service environment. Or they might hire somebody like Epic to come in and set up a workflow that then they can take over and do that going forward, but they will really need their subject matter expertise to understand all of the ins and outs. So that's how they can really sort of in that post-sales scenario create success on what we've sold them up front is to make sure that they really have the understanding and the know-how either on how to use that themselves or I believe more often than not they will still use that subject matter expertise um, and need that to actually drive um, the best practices and create success for an e E5 scenario. Um, I'm going to actually just show you, we have created a, uh, a partner showcase, um, and I'm going to actually pull that up right now and show that to you within 30 seconds before we go over to Power BI. Um, so you can actually see what it looks like. And you can actually uh, review some of the partners and make some decisions on those. Get a good feel for, for who's out there and um, who you might actually be able to partner with. All right. Here we go. So hopefully you guys can see this. So this is brand new. This has just a few of our partners that are up here. Um, and this, if you click, do a double click on any of these, we've got Discover Ready, Night Owl, um, we have Lighthouse, we have DTI Consulting, some of them have videos. And if you click on those, you can either get a feeling for the video, you see their profile, and it gives you um, context within Office 365. Of course, they've got websites, you can go and get into tons of detail on that, but there's contact information. There's also um, going to be an alias on the page, it's not here quite yet, but where you can get a hold of myself and others. So if you have specific questions or some type of a demographic question, we can actually um, help you navigate this as well. But this will have a complete list of all the partners, um, and right now there's roughly about 20 of them. So you can access this on um, the URL. Um, you can just go to the Partners Showcase. So it's partners.office.com. And you'll actually see that there's um, several different buckets of um, partners within the Partner Showcase. And uh, the eDiscovery partners are compliance and security is really the, the um, umbrella that we're under. So if you have questions about any of these, definitely please let us know. Um, but this is where sort of your landing pages and where you can go do some research if you need help with any of these. And of course, um, if you want further information on eDiscovery yourself, um, please let us know. Thank you, Michelle. That was, uh, that was really fantastic and uh, great information. Really appreciate it. We just had a couple of um, uh, questions that were outstanding that, that didn't get addressed. And somebody was asking, I don't know if you know this one, but uh, uh, she was wondering if, if, if you said that it's not available outside of an E5. In other words, can this be a standalone to an E3 or an E4? Yeah, that's a great question. There is the opportunity to sell standalone. So you can, so if you have a customer that has, uh, you know, E3 in place, you can sell them a standalone um, E5, uh, not the package, but the, the advanced e-discovery standalone. So yes, that's a great question. And um, one other one, which I think is interesting, um, uh, Gregory was wondering, uh, you know, since the acquisition of Equivio, has this uh, placed us anywhere better in the Gartner Magic Quadrant? Can you speak to that at all? I can't speak to that a little bit. I think we um, we need the Magic Quadrant to come out again <laughs> since all of that. Um, but we've been moving um, 
sort of from the bottom right-hand corner, which is where we've been, and we've been moving up, which is absolutely, that's what we want to do. We want to be moving up into the leader space. And um, the Equivio acquisition was one of, if, if you look behind the scenes, um, in terms of one of the um, objectives, that was definitely one of the objectives was to have an influence um, on that. Um, Equivio, for those of you um, not familiar with it, I, w I would imagine that would be most of you, was definitely, they were the um, leaders in terms of the predictive coding and analytics space. So if they were basically sort of the, the Kleenex, if you will, of the, um, of, of predictive coding and things like near duplication and email threading. So all those particular pieces, um, you know, were, were very common in terms of the e-discovery world. So Microsoft, of course, went out and, and purchased, um, you know, one of the best in the space. So that's great. Nice. A great yeah. story. And uh, again, really appreciate your time today. And, no problem. And uh, now we're ready to, to turn it over to uh, Alan Herrera. And uh, he's going to talk to us about Power BI. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to figure out how to advance the slide here. Oh, I've got to take over as presenter. Bear with me here. There we go. Okay, so I just wanted to start with this slide to set a little context on what Power BI is. Power BI is a data visualization solution that's included with E5 as part of Cortana Analytics Suite, our advanced analytics end-to-end -end solution, as well as standalone. Uh, and really the vision with Power BI is to provide business intelligence intelligence for everyone. In traditional BI, you had a model where IT, central IT, provided BI to end users. We then had the emergence of self-service BI, which really empowered analysts to deliver BI to end users. And now in the third wave, with uh, solutions like Power BI, we have the ability to uh, allow end users to deliver and create their own BI. And really, that's the vision and this really just maximizes uh, the potential market for this kind of solution. Um, high level, at a, at a product level, uh, this is uh, cloud-based in terms of where the reporting resides. Uh, you do have a free desktop client that comes with this called Power BI Desktop. Our competitors charge a significant licensing fee, subscription fee, I should say, for a similar solution. Really just uh, from a value standpoint, there's nothing comparable out there to Power BI. Um, I'll go through. Um, just a couple things, and uh, this is just a view I like to show that is, uh, again, a, a way to set context around our end-to-end -end analytics platform, uh, and this is brand new. We just put this together, and, and what I want to get across here is Microsoft is unique in our ability to deliver end-to-end -end analytics solutions on-premises or in the cloud, if you prefer, or in hybrid scenarios, and, and you see the SQL Server components of this that'll be available with SQL Server 2016, the Azure components of this uh, on this slide that are available with Cortana Analytics Suite, uh, and then from a consumption standpoint, um, Power BI plays a critical role in all of this. Um, Power BI works with Excel. Uh, it's got uh, a direct connection to SQL Server analysis services. And you also have the ability to take SQL Server reporting services reports and pin them directly to a Power BI dashboard. Uh, and this will only get better with SQL 2016, which will launch later this year. Um, and so I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide and talk about the core features of Power BI. And uh, at a consumption level, you have Power BI dashboards, which allows customers to see all their data in a single dashboard. Uh, you can show visualizations, KPIs, uh, and this uh, pertains to data that's on-premises or cloud-based. It really enables uh, us to present a consolidated view of the business, regardless of where that data lives. There's a really critical feature that I like to highlight when I talk about Power, Power BI, and that's called Natural Language Query. And I'll, I'll show you a very quick example when I go through a demo in a bit, but I, I used to work in finance many years ago, and when we went into a big executive review, we would create 40 or 50 slides to anticipate what kinds of questions we might get. What if we get a question on a view by segment or product? How do we cut it? And so there was a lot of redundant churn that went into creating reports. With things like natural language query, you could just ask a question, 
in natural language and instantly create a dashboard. And that's one of the great features you get with Power BI. Um, I mentioned Power BI Desktop earlier. Uh, again, this is uh, a free client that you get. It is what you use or one of the sources you can use to create reports that you then pin to Power BI. Um, and you can pull data from a number of different sources into desktop, of course. Um, finally, uh, well, not finally, the other piece of this is there are mobile apps that are available with Power BI. So there are native apps for Android, iOS, and Windows, of course. And so whether you're on a PC or if you're using a mobile phone, uh, you have the ability to consume uh, the, the Power BI dashboards uh, through various platforms. Um, finally, one of the really unique things we offer with Power BI are content packs. And so you, this is just a sampling of the services that you can connect directly to with Power BI, some of which are subscription-based. And, and the beauty of these solutions is, for example, if you have a Salesforce user, you just go to Power BI, you log on through a connection that's available on powerbi.com, and there will be pre-created uh, uh, dashboard visualizations that the end user can use to consume their Salesforce data or whatever connection they're using. Uh, and this is an ever-growing portfolio. Again, this is just a sampling. Um, we, of course, have direct connections to SQL Server analysis services, the ability to depend on SQL Server reporting services. This is really something, though, that's intended to work with any kind of data. So we also have connections to Oracle, Teradata, DB2, competitive platforms. As of course, there's, there's relevant data that our customers want to access on those platforms as well. A little bit of context on uh, where we sit from uh, an analyst point of view and what we're, how we're being recognized in the market. From a forester standpoint, we are recognized as a market leader. Uh, and I've, I've been around Power BI uh, in some way, shape, or form for about three years now. And it is just really uh, interesting to see the pace of change and the constant innovation that we continue to deliver with Power BI. Uh, we, we really uh, are updating this on a six-month rolling kind of time frame. And so we'll only continue to get better and better over time, but we are recognized at this point as having the ability to deliver enterprise-wide BI uh, through this platform. Uh, just a quick note on this, one of the uh, recent things we've added is the ability for our user base to submit uh, custom uh, data visualizations. Uh, and uh, this, these are just a few samples of some of the visualizations that our users out there have created, and this, again, will grow over time. Uh, we're effectively crowdsourcing um, visualizations and allowing our users, again, to create uh, things that are useful to them and share them with other users. So a little context on our, uh, our reach currently. Over 90,000 organizations use Power BI. It's available in 185 countries. And with the availability of Power BI with E5, now this is only going to get bigger, which is going to be a big opportunity for partners to go in and drive the deployment and business around helping customers to adopt uh, this platform. So let me uh, quickly go to a demo. I need to share my screen. Let me know when you can see my uh, screen, Michael. It's loading. OK. So what we'll load shortly is a view of a dashboard on PowerBI.com. This is uh, a CFO dashboard that we've created that showcases uh, four things, revenue and profitability management, expense management, financial planning and analysis, and risk and compliance. And in fact, what we've done is we've taken um, a Power BI desktop file where we've created these reports, and we've pinned uh, what we think are the most important views to a CFO into four different categories. And we go left to right, which is this, this first one here is revenue and profitability management. And the first thing I'll show you is we've, we've highlighted gross sales. And so the CFO is going to know, want to know what his or her gross sales are. In this case, $20 million. You can see their net uh, gross profit and net sales here. And if you want to go a little deeper here, all you got to do is click 
on any one of these tiles, and it's going to pull up the Power BI uh, desktop file uh, that we can use to drill down into some of these reports. And so the first thing I want to do is look at variance to budget by country. And we can, say, we can see that the U.S. is doing quite well. They have a $700,000 variance to budget that is positive. Uh, if I want to understand what's driving that, I just click on that bar. Bear with me here. I'm having a little trouble with my mouse. There we go. And, uh, and what this does is allow me to see what's driving that positive variance in the U.S. And you can see that all the other reports on the screen adjust to reflect just U.S. results. If we look at uh, the components of that performance, they did pretty well in uh, a number of things except for televisions, where they have a negative variance. This is a retail store, obviously. Um, and then from a loyalty standpoint, uh, they're not doing a good job of driving um, revenue as, as planned through existing customers, through loyalty programs. And so going back to that, uh, from a television standpoint, I want to see how other subsidiaries are doing. So I'm going to click on that. And now what I've got a view is of is uh, revenue performance for that category across all countries. And in this case, we can see that Brazil, in contrast to the U.S., has done quite well uh, and has a positive variance. So to go back to my screen, all I've got to do is uh, to my original report, the CFO dashboard, I've got to click back on uh, this link to the dashboard, and, and it loads it again. The next thing I want to look at is expense management. And um, bear with me here. So the first thing I want to look at is, I'm sorry, this is expense, and this will load uh, the, uh, the, the underlying report that I can use to drill down again. And in this case, it, it, you've got the same kind of categories uh, or same ability to drill down. What I want to highlight here is you can put in slashes as well. So in this case, I'm going to look at cost of goods sold. And that gives me the ability to see performance for cost of goods sold or sales and marketing from an expense standpoint. And again, the, the beauty of this is in the past, you had to create multiple views and put them together in some sort of PowerPoint and be prepared to go there and flip to the deck. You can do this in real time uh, with, uh, with Power BI. So going back, there's only one other thing. I won't go through all of this as we have a relatively limited amount of time um, to cover uh, everything. I just want to show you quickly uh, the natural language query ability. And so what this will do is it's going to dynamically create a report based on a natural language query. If there's an existing report, it's just going to pull it up automatically. So in this case, I'm going to look at revenue by region. And it dynamically created that chart. Uh, again, this already exists. It would create it if it didn't exist, and then I could simply pin this to my dashboard and reference it later as on an ongoing basis, basis if I so chose. So let me go back and transition a bit. The next thing I wanted to cover, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go back to the deck. Kim, can we reload that deck, please? So the last thing I wanted to cover is um, how we can uh, partner uh, to drive Power BI. And there's a couple of interesting programs I'd like to highlight. Let me just get to the right portion of the deck here. Bear with me. I need to take over as presenter. And so we've got a brand new program we're launching uh, in February uh, with a few partners. And this is open to all partners, but it's a unique opportunity that you will have to showcase the solutions you can deliver uh, on PowerBI.com. And uh, the uh, vision of this is that we have a tremendous partner ecosystem who have the ability to deliver industry and role-specific solutions. And uh, what you can do through this program is showcase a solution that you have developed on Power BI. It could be a healthcare solution, could be a manufacturing BI solution, whatever it might be. And uh, we will enable you through these links. This is a snapshot of PowerBI.com. 
there's a solutions link there. Uh, that is going to be changed effective February 4th, where customers will be able to go in and search for a healthcare solution, a retail solution, whatever it might be, and our partners will have the ability to showcase what they have uh, created uh, for those scenarios on this site. And this is just a quick snapshot of what it'll look like. So you're going to have a landing page. You'll have the ability to put up a video testimonial case study, uh, embed a Power BI dashboard that you've created, um, and, uh, and link to details uh, through pinpoints. Um, the way to get involved with this is through the Power BI Red Carpet Program. Uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, briefly. But if you are interested in getting started with Power BI, if you're not already a Power BI program, the first step you should really take is to go to uh, the red carpet link that I've included in this deck, and I'll show you that briefly, uh, where you can get trained, uh, readiness, there's uh, all the content you need uh, to talk about Power BI with customers. And there's a program uh, that we have uh, available there called Dashboard in a Day. And this is the second action that uh, I'd uh, like to ask partners to manifest interest in driving with us. What a Dashboard in a Day is, is a way of going to customers. Uh, these are typically business analysts, i.e. the end users of Power BI, and uh, running them through a session where we provide hands-on experience on how to use Power BI. Uh, so they will understand how they can use this in their business and uh, be able to walk away being able to build their own reports. From this engagement, uh, the next step would be to drive a on-site uh, POC with a customer where you would take their data and build a working dashboard over the course of a half day or full day, depending on how much time you want to spend there. From there, that's where you would have the ability to drive an SI engagement to deliver uh, an enterprise-wide or departmental solution. Um, I have some funding available for Dashboard in a Day. Um, you can reach out uh, to me directly once you've enrolled in the Power BI Red Carpet Program. What we're offering is a $2,500 uh, per session investment on our behalf through the PI Program if you're interested in driving these with us. Um, of course, we have ample BIF uh, uh, funding available to drive POCs. And then uh, effective February, uh, partners enrolled in Power BI Red Carpet can also showcase their solutions on PowerBI.com. So I'm going to quickly share my screen again, and I will have some time for questions. So the, uh, the red carpet program, you would just need your uh, Microsoft Partner Network uh, ID to log in. I've already logged in in this case, and uh, still loading. Bear with me. Should be coming up just a sec. Okay, we're live. So this is a landing page for the Power BI Red Carpet Program. Um, and uh, you can see you've got everything you need to get started. Benefits Red Carpet. There's a concierge service that comes with that if you need help with Power BI or have any questions. Uh, there's uh, on-demand training you can take uh, to understand how to use Power BI and build solutions on it. Um, and then uh, from a pre-sale support standpoint, there's a number of resources. Right here is a link to Dashboard in a Day for that program. If you click on that link, uh, you'll see that you'll get access to all the content you'll need to drive those sessions, uh, including the, uh, the sample data sets you would use uh, for uh, delivering these. With that said, uh, thank you for joining the webinar today. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any from the uh, audience. There, there are a couple, and I, um, I really like the way that they've incorporated um, partners right into the actual service. And so if I'm a customer and I get excited, I connect to some uh, content packs and see some value and maybe I want to do more. Maybe I want to go uh, match that up with some other data that I have on premises. Uh, they can find a partner right from within PowerBI.com. So if uh, anybody on the call hasn't actually visited there, you can just go ahead and log into Power BI. You can see some samples there. You can actually just click on the find a partner and you can see all the partners available. And so if you want to be one of those partners, uh, uh, last time I checked, right from within that same link, 
you can actually get to learn more information about the red carpet program. so and it sounds like some of these new capabilities that are coming where i can showcase my own dashboard is probably going to be incorporated within that same experience, i suppose. yes, it is. that's great. so the one question we have around is around content packs. i see that there's a content pack for already. and and so just for content packs, just to reiterate, this is how i can connect up to those services from within power bi and get all that value just kind of immediately and i see crm online is out there, dynamics nav and the question is will it connect to dynamics ax? is that something, a content pack that's coming? that's a good question. i don't know right off hand. i can check and see if i can see it very quickly here. i did just take a quick look at the connector but just so for those on the phone that are watching this you just go to power bi and say get data and then you can see uh, all the available content packs that we have here and this list is is growing. you can add to this every day and you just connect to one of these SaaS services, you log in and you uh, can immediately connect up with your data source. all that modeling and uh, the reporting and the dashboards are already pre-built for you and so um, that's why we say five minutes, no, five seconds to sign up and five minutes to wow. so what we're looking for is uh, just an additional content pack. CRM online is there. Uh, Office 365 data is either there now or it's coming. We uh, That's uh, been announced on the roadmap. And so uh, we'll have to get back to you and see if uh, Dynamics AX is uh, going to be coming soon. So the other uh, question is, was just uh, somebody was wondering if there are any plans for SQL Server reporting services to be included in a, a Azure SQL as a, a service product. Have you heard anything like that? That I have not, and uh, I've seen the roadmap. I would have to follow up on that. I, I haven't seen anything that I, I'm aware of yet. Okay, great. Um, we will uh, try to follow up on that. And we do have your email, so all of you who have uh, asked questions that uh, that didn't get answered, I think we did a pretty good job of answering questions today. Uh, but we do have your email address, so we'll provide follow up. And don't forget, you can always. Uh, Ask questions anytime uh, if you're watching this recording after the fact on our uh, on our Yammer group, and we will make sure that they get to the to the right folks. More questions. Are there more questions there? Oh yeah, a couple more questions uh, came in. Um, is BIF available for dashboard in a day uh, and POCs for SMBs? Um, so the dashboard in a day program is funded through Pi, uh, and uh, that's $2,500 per dashboard in a day engagement. And so we're not really using BIF to deliver uh, dashboard in a day. For POCs, um, we, we absolutely do have BIF available within the COSA BIF program for Power BI. To the, I'm not aware personally from a partner standpoint if SMB partners have the ability to access COSA BIF, but it'd be in line with, with whatever BIF requirements we have. There's nothing unique per se about uh, Power BI BIF versus any other BIF program. Okay, thank you. And then uh, let's see, what is the link to join the Power BI Red Carpet program? Yeah, so we can, uh, it's in the deck, but let me see if I can just pull that up. Uh, it's aka.powerbi, I'll have to pull it up actually. And like I said, I believe um, right on powerbi.com, the last time I checked, if you go to um, find a partner link down there on the left hand side, uh, I believe there's a, also a link for partners who are not currently Power BI partners to uh, join the program. So you may find it right from within the service. And let's see. Well, we're coming to, actually, we're at the top of the hour. So there's just a couple of um, outstanding questions, which we will uh, try and stay on the line and report after the call. But I know Kim needs to close out uh, the call here at the top of the hour. Um, I do want to uh, thank our presenters today, Alan, also Michelle, for uh, the great content today and everybody's participation on the call. And I uh, encourage you to uh, complete your surveys.
and look forward to uh, seeing you next month. Did you have one last uh, comment, Alan? Yeah, so that link is aka.ms slash Power BI Partner. Oh, there you go. Nice. Simple. And uh, so, Kim, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. We look forward to seeing you um, next month, uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, SharePoint and the hybrid opportunities, a lot new with uh, SharePoint 2016, a lot of exciting opportunities uh, for partners. And um, Kim, are you there? I am. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your feedback is important. We hope that you found today's information helpful. Please take a few minutes to let us know by completing a short survey, and you will see it on the left-hand side of the screen. Please click on the Messages button to find the link to the survey. And you can access the web conference recording via a link that will be delivered within 72 hours post-conference. And I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters, Michael, Michelle, and Alan. This concludes today's web conference.